that's how it works. Excellent. Now, once again, welcome to our office hours that we run every Wednesday. This is a chance for you guys to ask questions on everything related to uh, Config Manager, MDT, Intune, Imaging, most Windows related stuff. My name is Johan, I'll be host for the next hour, and as usual, I absolutely love questions. For those of you joining the Zoom meeting here, please feel free to simply use the Q&A function here in Zoom to ask your questions. And for those of you joining our other feeds, we are sending to Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube at the same time. I am monitoring those chats up here uh, on my screen to the left. So I will try to keep a quick, uh, <laughs> try to uh, keep track of those questions coming in uh, as well. Excellent. I'm gonna change the view of the screen a little bit so you can actually have a chance to. Uh, see the screen here also. Now, any questions at all? Anything I can answer for you? All right, while we're waiting for a few questions to come in. Oh, there we have the first one. Uh, Tim is asking, how can we reinstall apps for users before they log in to a replacement device? Uh, we have CM and starting to use Intune. Uh, is there a solution uh, through Config Manager or is there a different solution with Intune? Well, if you are redeploying a device, there are certainly ways in, in Config Manager to, um, uh, to do that. Uh, some of our customers, they base this on inventory data. So they basically, during deployment, they have a script that asks Config Manager, hey, this device that I'm deploying, uh, what applications did it have? And then make sure to tell the sequence to install the same apps or newer versions of those apps uh, on the machine. Uh, that solution goes back probably a good decade. Um, have something here I can show, I believe. Um, let's see here. Um, yes, SQL. Um, so back in the days when MDT integration with Poplar was very, very common. These days it's just somewhat common. Uh, the MDT developers came up with the idea of having tables doing mappings between old programs and new programs. And they also installed uh, or made available store procedures that allow you to track this information. It's called retrieve packages. That was for legacy packages back then. But you can do the same thing for, uh, for applications. So this was a simply a store procedure that you ran as part of the sequence that listed all the apps that the client had. Uh, previously what's known as known to Config Manager and then make sure that the sequence applied them um, to the same one. So if you do a bit of, of a search on this one, uh, you'll find a few posts on how to use it. Uh, you will have to adopt that script a little bit because it was designed for Config Manager 07, I believe. Uh, let's see. Let me do that. And let's do a procedure in the query. Procedure. Uh, here are some sample guides. Uh, I can put that link into the uh, chat. Uh, other solutions I've been seeing and that we actually touched upon here on the academy 
before is I have seen customers using groups in AD to store info about config man apps. So basically what you have is uh, you have various software groups in, in AD and these software groups have a reference in them using an unused attribute to packages uh, like this one here or application model apps like this one here inside of config manager. And during your sequence, you have a script that queries a web service that enumerates the AD membership. So every member of every group will basically generate a list of apps. And that in turn will um, make sure that the sequence get a listing of all the apps that the machine is supposed to have and make sure to install the same apps as part of the imaging process. Um, I do have a guide on how to set that up. I think I call it dynamic something. Um, yeah, install applications and pack it as dynamically during OSD through AD groups. So this is intended for a reinstall scenario where you want to make sure that whatever app that was on the system before is on the system after uh, reinstall or re-image. And this can be either a bare metal deployment or it can be a computer refresh. Both of those will actually delete all the apps that you might have. Uh, for Intune, I haven't seen uh, anything similar to this. Um, You can probably ditch the, well, maybe you can ask manage apps inventory in Intune and make sure to, to uh, through some backend scripting, assign the same applications to computers. Uh, might be dual, but it's not something I have tried. I mean, all apps that you have deployed through Intune, they're obviously available out there. You can track with machines that have them and you can to the same type of deployments, but that, that uh, sounds like a bit of work. Um, other than that, the Intune, since it's working with groups, as long as the new device or the machine after device is in the same group, it should receive the same uh, applications. All right, I hope that answered the, the question somewhat. Uh, I have a few questions coming in from uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I was so into OSD, but I'm now involved with ServiceNow, ITSM tooling. Would love to know about your opinion on OS deployment through ServiceNow orchestration. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I have not worked with that at all. I don't really, I don't know how it works. So I cannot answer that question, I'm afraid. Um, I've only used ServiceNow as a ticketing system. A lot of our customers using that to you know, help desk in similar tasks. Um, so, sorry, I have no idea about that one. Uh, another question on LinkedIn, what's your recommendation on management points in an environment? Uh, is it a good idea to have the MP role on distributed points or DPs in your environment? Uh, in general, Config Manager, the best approach to design is to keep things simple. Uh, Fun fact, when, when I was in high school in Sweden, I happened to be uh, in one of 12 cities in the country that offered American football as a sport you can start to play. So I did that for a good few years. And we had an American coach that helped us and his favorite expression was KISS, keep it simple, stupid. And that goes a long way for config manager design as well. Uh, from a supportability point of view, each management point in Config Manager will happily support about 25,000 clients, at least from a tested perspective. But if you have that many clients, you usually have a few of them, not forced necessarily being supported, but to have a little bit of, of flexibility and redundancy. But if you are smaller environment, five, six, 7,000 clients, there is usually no need to have more than one management point. The traffic that goes into it and out from it is pretty lightweight. 
And what you can do if you start to face performance issues, rather than, if I can find the paint window here that is unused, uh, this one will do just fine. Uh, if you have a multiple environment network uh, or starting to scale out in the number of clients, rather than trying to do things like putting out a remote SQL or, or anything like that, it makes more sense to simply break out the user-facing roles from Config Manager because those are usually the ones that, I mean, the name implies that they are indeed the ones that the clients are talking to. So software update point, management point, distribution points, put them away from the site server and you'll find that you have a system that will handle much more load, but still being very responsive uh, when you need to do admin work on it. So um, it's one of these, it depends. Um, I mean, for example, if you have a, an organization that has uh, a large site over in Europe and you have a large site here in North America and within the site connectivity is fantastic but in between North America and, and, or, and Europe that's very weak link it might make perfect sense to have an MP in each of those locations and definitely distribution points in those locations but again don't spin up MPs just because there is an option to do it do it when there's a kind of a need and makes sense for it keep things simple that that goes a long way in my opinion uh, so we usually do not put MPs on every DP for example we usually have more DPs than we have MPs um, even if you're big into peer-to-peer -peer and all that stuff uh, that's usually the case uh, one large customer working with 60,000 clients uh, they have about five six MPs in total uh, over the globe but they have like 20 some DPs that give you a little bit of a, a perspective there. Let's see, another question on LinkedIn. Can we, oh, let's see here. How can we put a collection of passive Microsoft clusters into a collection in a real-time basis for patching? Uh, the closest feature in Config Manager for that will be uh, Face software updates and orchestration groups. That way you can sort of create a little flow uh, to deal with cl uh, clusters. Um, another approach, if you're close to do scripting uh, deployments for those to get you a more flow. But um, if you look up uh, face software update groups, deployment, I should say. Uh, so this will be one of them. Um, can put this link in the chat for you guys. And on the academy, we, uh, every time we have these office hours, the links and stuff that we share, uh, they are added to the site as well. So after the today's broadcast we, we upload the video and we upload the links so if you go to the Academy site and scroll down to office hours uh, they will be added here once you're in the course so and we also have for all these we started this back in Tom November and we have all recordings from earlier uh, as well uh, just a sidebar there and then of course we have uh, orchestration groups uh, this is a good reading as well and, and they were targeted for these type of scenarios so you have a set of service that you want to work with but you can't do like all at once um, and you can even do manual groups in here um, so I'll put that in the chat as well so that is what config money offers to stage uh, roll us automatically. Uh, there is also nothing that prevents you from simply work with multiple uh, collections. That was very popular, uh, still is very popular to control the rings. So multiple server groups with multiple maintenance windows and you simply put different servers in different 
collections and when you deploy you deploy to a normal production collection but that one in turn includes all these collections having uh, the maintenance windows and they will behave after that so if you stage up your service in the order where you want them to be patched in different maintenance windows that will be the order uh, that, that they will be made available for software updates. So you do have a, a few different options available uh, for that. Uh, Charles is asking, are we going to release a Steel and with Pride book for Windows 11 deployments? It's certainly something that we wanted to do, but these days it's been really hard to uh, write books, really. First of all, it's, it's quite time consuming. It, it takes even a, a thinner book takes several months of writing just to, to get into sort of a good shape. And this today, the, the cadence is so quick. Uh, Config Manager is being released three times a year, updates in between. Intune has updates every month and sometimes multiple times in a month. Uh, there is simply so much going on. So once you write something and put it out there, it's already old. So it's a little bit frustrating. <laughs> As, as a writer to put in a good few months of work and then like, okay, it's old. But uh, something that I want to do, uh, absolutely, but nothing that is on the schedule uh, right now. Uh, what we have been doing uh, instead is um, on the blog or the deployment research blog, uh, we have been publishing quicker uh, deployment guides that are 70, 80 pages long. So it's like a small book, but these have been easier to update because we just keep them online. It's not a printed edition. And we have one in the works for Windows 11. I just haven't had a chance to, to publish it. So uh, uh, some written documentation will be out there, but it's not as, as big as the older, thicker, three, 400 pages um, uh, of books. Uh, that being said, I mean, <laughs> Even though it's 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 a really old, a um, lot of the customizations in it, this one here, still works, still valid. Uh, my only sort of uh, regret from back then, uh, when we wrote this book, this was in 2014, was that we we selected between uh, Visual Sources and GitHub uh, as a sort of source control version or visual source control. And we picked the wrong one. We should pick GitHub uh, when we described that chapter. But otherwise, this one is, is up to date and, and works with the stuff that, that you have there. Uh, no, sorry. Even if it's not up to date, the stuff works uh, for sure. All right. Another question from Tim. Um, is there any other scripting technologies such as MSIX that will be fill up installation of large apps in Windows 11? Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, what I do or what we do to, to speed up, for example, this application here. Um, uh, let me go over here. That was GitHub. That was not where I was going. Uh, so here I have some large applications like an Autodesk Fader Studio Max app, which itself is, is not very big. But it, it, if you look at the size and compare it to the number of files, it's simply a package with a ton of smaller files. Very, very ineffective to deploy uh, either through Intune or Config Manager or both doesn't matter, especially when you take into account uh, HTTPS deployments. Now, luckily, Intune, when you prepare Win32 apps, it packages that all into one file. So uh, it's compressed. So it, it makes this one better. Conflict Manager by default does not. So what we've been doing uh, quite a lot lately is simply, um, let's see. I put that one. <laughs> Here, application as web files. So we use one script to take an existing package in Config Manager or application, doesn't matter, and create a web file out of it. 
So not only is it going to be compressed, it's going to be a single file, much faster to download and deploy. And then we have wrapper scripts that installs them. So a wrapper script that simply figures out where the WIM file is, mounts the WIM file, installs the app, whatever that app may be, and does, uh, then dismount the WIM file. So this is typically how you can speed up application deployments uh, quite a bit. Um, you can also use sequences if you deploy a lot of them, flip the machine over in high performance plan, get some performance out of that, flip it back out of performance plan when the sequence is done and config Bandy will do that for you. So this is what we typically see out there. Um, Sune over in Denmark, he has a really good post about this. Um, we go. Soon the Thompson, um, whim your applications like a boss, and there are many others like this. This is just a nice write up uh, for config manager what you need to add some sample scripts and whatnot. So, if you haven't seen this article, highly recommend it. Put that in the chat for you. And again, these links will be uploaded to the Academy afterwards. You will have access to them. Right, any other questions? Anything I can help you with? Right, while we're waiting for more questions to come in, uh, I do have a few uh, small announcements. Um, for those of you that are attending the Perfect Lab uh, two weeks back, that recording is available. So if you missed that uh, community session, you can join that one for free and get access to it. Uh, that one we did in late December is also available, also a free community uh, course. And we have an upcoming one uh, very, very shortly. So next week, February 9, uh, we have no other than Richard Hicks is coming in to give us a complete uh, rundown on always on VPN, which is a quite popular topic these days. So if you have a chance to join. The price is just right. It's one of the ones we do for the community, like the office hours and uh, we run it on 9 a.m. Central Time. So uh, that should be fun. If you haven't seen this one, I'll get that link in the chat as well. But this is something I'm looking forward to. Uh, can't actually see it, but maybe if I hold this one up, uh, it's actually uh, an entire book about always on VPN that Richard put together. Uh, it's the best resource I've seen uh, on the topic. So uh, good one right there. All right. So let's see, another question coming in. Uh, autopilot, how to get the CM client installed? Uh, and run all the policies in a timely fashion. Uh, first of all, uh, the documentation around this and the real world doesn't go exactly hand in hand. Uh, the way that Microsoft wants you to do this uh, is the following. And this is what I still have in their documentation. So if I go to one of my tenants, uh, Go to one of my apps here. And let's see. Yeah, yeah, this one. This is an older, uh, older one. And let's see. Yeah. So this is a line of business app, just with a command line argument to install that one from your uh, cloud management gateway. And uh, this doesn't work. This doesn't work at all. What you want to do is instead uh, use a Win32 app for the, the CM client. And in fact, if you call Microsoft support, 
and you have issues with the um, uh, MSI Islander business app, they're going to tell you to do this. So this is usually the good, the best solution. So um, yeah, there is that. Uh, there are some posts around this. Um, uh, I was actually searching for some of those. We did an intern course Monday, and there were some questions related to this as well. Um, let's see if I can find those. Yeah, you can see we, we visited these um, earlier. So this is the official documentation, and then this is um, uh, some other solutions um, instead. Some examples, how you prepare it, detection methods, uh, and other good things for it. And this will give you a better, uh, better reliability on this one. Because when you have the old style LOV apps and Win32 Win apps, they, they basically fight. Uh, they will try to install at the same time, and the timing is just going to break things. Uh, Win32 apps, they will queue up nicely. Um, so. If you haven't seen Martin's post here, uh, Martin Bankson, he is also the guy behind the very, very popular toast notification uh, thing. But this is a good one. So I'll put this one in the chat and will be uploaded to the link uh, list later as well. Here we go. All right. Great questions. Um, any other questions? And something to know about this stuff as well. Win32 apps in Intune doesn't have to be guest applications. They can be scripts as well. So just like Intune can run scripts and even proactive remediation scripts, you can have Win32 apps that are scripts. I uh, can show you an example here. Go to my apps and search for peer-to-peer. -peer. These are test applications I'm using when, when we're doing delivery optimization, benchmarking, and other things. But these apps are, if you see the properties in the command line here, they are just PowerShell scripts that runs uh, for both install and uninstall. So you can have pretty advanced wrappers in Intune that does multiple things. Doesn't have to be just a setup exe dash or something or a MSI exec forward slash I and a MSI. It can be, you can do pretty cool stuff here. Uh, so, yeah. Wonder if I added a link to one of those. See, uh, uh, maybe, maybe not. I can find this little friend. I did not have that one. Um, Peter Vander. I think it was Peter that did it. What's this? Oh, that's what's the requirement script. Peter has a ton of different posts related to Win32 apps. I've been part of this one here. Package manager things. It was scripting certain. Ah, I'll leave that one for now. Interesting read though, uh, for sure. Uh, was a follow-up question on LinkedIn regarding cluster uh, passive nodes. How can we best discover them for a collection? 
Uh, I have not done a collection for passive clusters. Um, if there is no ready-made system resource that you can find for them, uh, you can definitely have a script running on them that tags something in, say, a registry that you inventory, extend your, your hardware inventory to get that into a collection structure. So basically, if you have a registry key on every machine that, that is supposed to, to be a, a cluster node, and that node at some point has been active and uploaded that hardware inventory to Config Manager, then you can query that info for your collections. So maybe that, unless there is a ready-made uh, option or WMI value that you can ask in inventory, you can certainly extend it um, to this. Um, and I mean, we can certainly do a quick uh, um, of close, maybe. Service display name like cluster service. That might work. Another idea of just extending inventory to get those WMI classes from cluster nodes. Um, so, yeah. I'll put this link up there as well. May give you some ideas on on, on uh, what to do. Uh, uh, Henrik is asking a follow up question regarding cluster nodes. Is it a way to make basically fail over have an active node go over to pass a node before patching? Uh, in Config Manager, um, through the orchestration groups, you can uh, have actions that runs on machines. Um, I'm assuming you can use uh, state of filter rules in Config Manager as well to detect things and then have a script run to fail them over. But uh, it's not something I have tried, um, uh, unfortunately. All right. Uh, it's another question coming in. Uh, with all Windows updates uh, issues, oh, sorry, with all the Windows updates issues recently, what are your recommendations for how long to delay deployment in pipe and production groups? Uh, and would you do anything different when you have less control in maybe? Uh, Windows Update for Business or, or Intune. Uh, well, had you asked me a few years back, I usually went ahead and allowed ADRs to deploy updates right away for my, uh, uh, even my pilot groups. So I would have both in Intune and in uh, Config Manager, I would have uh, one or more pilot collections that I would use and I would allow one ADR to download updates and immediately make it available for that group. But these days, uh, because there has been so many incidents over the last two years, three years on software updates, I have delayed even that one to about four days. And the production testing starts a little bit later, maybe seven to 10 days. Uh, the challenge these days is a lot of organizations have basically their own SLA being uh, enforced for them. Uh, for example, all the companies that are in any way related to infrastructure here in the U.S. are typically now under uh, additional TSA guidelines on how quickly they should update machines. And those deadlines are pretty harsh. So you basically need to get updates out there within a month. And that is started getting hard when you also delay when you start with them. But something around four 
three, four days for, for pilots, something in between seven to 10 days uh, for production should give you enough time to abort if something goes wrong, like it did now in, in early January. Uh, that was a, unfortunately a good chunk of organizations that ran into troubles because the update or employed updates fell quickly um, in, in their environments. Um, the number one source to get this feedback, if you're not on Twitter, get on Twitter. That is my personal number one source for information and updated information. Support teams are there, the config manager team is there, the Intune folks are there, the Microsoft MVPs are there, and a lot of other people in the community. And usually if there is a trouble, uh, for example, with software updates, you will hear about this in minutes on Twitter. So if you're not on Twitter, get on Twitter, select a good few people to follow. You don't have to write anything. You can just use it as a monitoring platform. And apparently there is a live broadcast right now going on also. Weird. Yeah, anyhow, good stuff. All right, let's see what else. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, okay. Another question from Tim here. What is your perspective on bias and drivers updated? Well, that is also one of those that have changed. Have you guys asked me 10 years ago what my position was on constantly updating bias and drivers just because there was a new version available? My answer would probably would have been something like, yeah, over my dead body, that's going to happen. But these days, uh, it turns out that, first of all, quality of bias updates and drivers has been much better. Microsoft now do more testing, certification, code reviews, or things that uh, are being released as drivers in their environment. Uh, vendors does a better job with their biases as well than they used to back in the past. And we live in a different world. So Microsoft currently tracks, I think it's like the last number I've heard was um, uh, 1.3 billion devices uh, with running Windows 10. Uh, any version of Windows 10, and that's a good chunk of devices. Uh, out of those, uh, a good 200 million plus are uh, enterprise managed machines. And uh, Microsoft get telemetry from this, and they can basically prove that organizations that are more proactive in updating drivers and biases are having fewer issues in general. And also, there have been uh, plenty of, of incidents the last two years. For example, in March last year, HP published a list of 20 some of their business models where you had to be on a specific bias version in order to install uh, Windows 20 H2, I think it was. So there will be certain scenarios for that. And even now with, with Windows 11 piloting starting, same story there. You have to update biases on some machine to be able to run it. So I am much more uh, happy about doing driver updates uh, proactively these days. Uh, the solution I recommend uh, out there, because Config Man doesn't have it, Intune doesn't have it yet, it's a solution called Modern Driver Management and Modern Bias Management. What it basically means, these are PowerShell scripts that help you download the driver packages. Uh, for example, here. Let's see what version I have on this one. some uh, version. So this is a tool to help you download drivers and BIOSes and create those packages automatically in, in Config Manager. 
And once you have that, you simply can have BIOS update sequences that you push out. You can also have uh, driver update sequences that you uh, push out and keep them updated. Because this solution here, uh, it works with uh, bare metal deployments, it works with servicing sequences, and it works with just pure updating of drivers. Now, uh, Microsoft is working on a new deployment service for this. That was in private preview the entire 2021, more or less. But uh, let me see if I can find the November post. Uh, might it be this one? No, that's the old post. Bing doesn't always give you the best. This is the one we want. Google to the rescue. Uh, so this one is from November, uh, published during the Ignite. But this is what Microsoft is working on to allow you to do controlled updates of uh, BIOSes, firmware, drivers through Intune co-managed devices. Uh, of course, the current setting for Intune in terms of drivers is on or off. That, that's it. That's the entire setting. But this service, you will get many, many more, much better controls of it. And the big vendors, they are board, IBM, uh, sorry, IBM, Lenovo, uh, Dell, uh, HP, they're all on board. Uh, in the one from March, they actually, if I can find, let me post this one in the chat first. Because this one from March, in the end of it, also has some videos explaining the concept and some interviews with the engineers from these organizations. So I'll put this link in the chat as well. Even though it's older, the info is good. Um, all right. Okay, another question. Is it easy to install Windows updates during autopilot a white glove? Um, if you are in a white glove scenario, you're basically in, in control of that box. I mean, I would recommend that the image that is deployed to that box is fully patched from the beginning and that you don't have to worry about updates. Um, I actually don't know. I mean, if there are updates deployed to the machine and you allow it to go through and you wait around long enough, it might be possible that they, they come down, but it's not something I have tried. Uh, let's see if we can find something. Oh, White Love, it, they changed the name of it recently. Now it's called pre provisioning Devices. Uh, see Mike in E-House. He was the lead behind Autopilot before he left for Tanium. It seems like he has been posting some solutions for this. Basically has an update script that it runs. I mean, that works. You can have an app that runs a Windows update script. I'll go for this one. In general, I have good faith in Mr. Nehouse. Some of the best autopilot information out there is still the best, even though it, it has a few years on it. I'll put that link in the chat. So hopefully that one. PowerShell is king. Scripting is also king. Uh, 
question coming in on YouTube here uh, from Ross. Do you have any idea or any advice on running PowerShell within the sequence to get clearer logging? Uh, it usually for me it's been providing better logging in the scripts themselves. So when you write wrapper scripts for whatever it is, if you put in some decent logging in those, that is in, in general the, the best way to provide logging. Uh, the only thing I would I'd recommend, uh, Adam has a, um, or actually there are quite a few people out there, but um, PowerShell. So uh, Adam has a few examples on how to log things so they are formatted in the way that, that config managers in trace will read them. And in, in terms of logging there, that, that's usually what I recommend. I mean, I have probably hundreds or if not thousands of scripts and different type of logging mechanisms. Uh, in them that has been sort of developed over the years. So sometimes I have just a very, very simple logging mechanism uh, depending on what I was doing. So like this one here that I'm using to fix up branch cache stuff. Uh, <laughs> this is the entire logging function. And I just put a date and I write some info in it and then in the script uh, for different actions, that will be a write log something. But if you add in more robust modules for logging that can track, overwrite, retain, uh, and you keep that consistent, then you have a much better logging module. For our PSD solution uh, that we have, uh, Jordan Benting helped us with, um, uh, let's see if I have those. Here. This is a community solution for uh, MDT to get PowerShell support. But in our installer script, we also have uh, logging modules or logging functions that, that we use to, to have available. So something like this, put that in your scripts and be consistent about using it. And then um, you will find troubleshooting much easier. Uh, Maurice in their script, Maurice and Nikolai, they also have some decent logging you can look at. Uh, if you open one of their scripts, like the invoke, um, this one here for the driver updates or driver packages. Here is logging as well in this one uh, that you can tap into and see what they're doing. So good stuff there. All right, uh, David had a question on Facebook. Let's see. If what if we have all the devices, Windows 7 devices, we still need to bring, uh, bring up to Windows 10 and they are on VPN. Yeah, so that's a challenge because if you use sequences to drive your servicing or upgrades through a cloud management gateway, that sequence is going to reboot and it's going to want to talk back and continue when it's done. If you were connected through a VPN, you may not get that connection back unless your VPN setup is so that the machine itself will authenticate and, and log in and all that stuff. And that usually doesn't happen. So for those scenarios, I would actually recommend uh, not using sequences, but rather um, a solution we've showcased here in the academy quite a bit. It's our friends over at OneWin in, in, in the Nordics in Sweden. Uh, Johannes Trevelius and Jörgen Nilsson, they have been part of this solution. But this is an app, a free app that you can download. And it was intended to run servicing for machines that are connected through VPN, for example. Because this application obviously doesn't need to continue like a sequence would when it's done. 
So if you haven't seen this one, uh, great stuff, free community, well tested, uh, highly recommended for that scenario. Putting that link in the chat for you will be uploaded to the uh, uh, site later. All right, any other questions? We have a whooping uh, six minutes to go here. see any more questions coming in uh, do like to mention that next week we are running this at 2 p.m. Uh, central time um, and this is because we have Richard coming in in the morning doing our mini course on always on the VPN there so uh, thank you everyone for for joining uh, thank you so much for all the good questions and uh, I hope to see you guys uh, next week again. Thank you so much.